Trusted by 35% of the Fortune 100, Twistlock is the world's first truly comprehensive cloud-native security platform, providing holistic coverage across hosts, containers, and serverless in a single platform. Twistlock is cloud-native and API-enabled itself, protecting all your workloads, regardless of what underlying compute technology powers them. Hey, it's Alex Williams of the New Stack, and I'm with John Morello. Hey, John. Hey, Alex. John is CTO of Twistlock, and he is showing us Twistlock 19.03 today, 19.03. And I'm just going to ask him to take it away. John. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, so one of the things that, that's the, the real focus for Twistlock 1903 is bringing the capabilities we have for protecting cloud-native environments that, that have historically really been focused on containers and serverless with Twistlock, providing those same capabilities for VMs and for, for just kind of hosts generically as well. And the reason for that is we've really heard a lot of feedback from our customers over the past year telling us that, that the traditional tools that they've been using to protect VMs that they were running as part of their cloud-native stack you know, were, were typically single-purpose. So they had to have a lot of different tools that often conflicted with each other, and they weren't really modern cloud-native apps themselves. They weren't programmatically accessible. The data wasn't easily available via an API. And they really you know, liked the approach that we took for containers and, and asked if we could do those same kinds of things for their traditional VMs as well. Uh, and that's basically the, been the main focus of this 1903 release. So I'm going to show you guys a few uh, a few uh, demos that are, are relevant to features in this space that kind of show you the breadth of what we do from a, uh, a platform perspective for protecting those VMs. And then we'll drill into a few of the cooler features and, and show, show those off to you as well. So the place that we're going to start is uh, this view that we call our radar view. Now, this, this particular radar view that you're looking at isn't super exciting because I only have a single node in this environment. Typically, you would see for each individual node, you'd see all the connections from the apps that run on it to other applications and be able to see that same kind of topology map that, that you're probably familiar with uh, that we do for containers. Um, what we're doing for host is, is we're trying to pivot that not based on the individual node, but on the apps that you're running on that node. And the reason why that makes more sense is the typical way that you're operating these VMs at scale is you're, you're operating in with that cattle versus pets mentality. You know, you've got a whole bunch of VMs that are configured more or less identically or very close to identically. And so it doesn't make sense to create this view that's focused on individual nodes because you don't care about the nodes, you care about the workloads that they're running. So let's take a look at the way that we model each one of those workloads and the kind of capabilities and information that we show to you about it. And then we'll drill into some other features that we have in the platform to, to complete the security story that we have. We'll take a look just to begin with, like uh, just at SSH, for example. So for each one of the, uh, the apps that we learn in your environment, we show you information about the way that that application is configured, the way that it, it behaves, basically. So this is all dynamically learned. So for example, we choose SSH here. Um, you can notice here, provide a little bit of information about what the application is. We show you some information about the ports that we've learned that it uses um, and show you information about the nodes that it runs on. In this case, again, it's just a single node environment. But if you had an environment where you had SSH running on hundreds of nodes, you know, you'd see a truncated list of, of what those hundreds of nodes look like over here. So you could have a clear idea for what's the scope of coverage for any given workload that you're running. Um, if we take a look at something else, for example, like this Google Accounts daemon, for example, one of the other things I'll point out to you as well is for each one of the apps that we learn, we show you the capability model that we develop for it. Capabilities is kind of an interesting approach, I think, that we've taken for uh, runtime modeling for hosts, because one of the things that we found is Unlike containers, hosts are, are kind of by definition more general purpose. You know, you're going to be doing more different things with the host over time than you will with containers. And so it's hard to create a very tightly scoped, completely predictive model of everything that a host will do purely based on observed behaviors. So we have this notion of capabilities in which we say, if we see a particular thing that is being done, a particular action that's being taken by one of these applications, we assume that it should have this entire set of capabilities around it because it's reasonable to think that if it does one of these, it's probably going to do other ones, even if those things haven't been observed. And a great example of that is this user admin capability. You know, we don't care, we don't look and just say that we're only going to add, for example, the process called user add. 
if we see a background service, like in this case, the, the Google accounts daemon is what GCP uses to manage local accounts and permissioning of local users and groups. If we see that account or that service, that service rather creating accounts on a host, we're going to assign it this user admin capability, which for Twistlock internally means we're also going to allow it to run the same processes that it would be used to manage groups, to delete user accounts, to edit user accounts, because it's reasonable to assume that if this background service is going to be used to create accounts, it's probably going to have a broader set of needs as well. And that allows us to not have false positives around that future predictive capability for what that thing will be doing, even though we're only observing it for a short period of time. And so this capability that we have for modeling all the applications you see in the environment here enables you to have this, um, again, autonomous learned approach to what's normal in your environment, and then to be able to look for anomalies relative to what that model predicts. Um, you can see from, you know, from a networking standpoint, um, if we go back, let's say to SSH, for example, um, we'll show you the, the ports that are being used here. Uh, we show you information, again, about the host that it's running on. Of course, you can drill down on that. You can see vulnerabilities that are related um, to that host, all the, the CVEs that impact it. So you have a single view where you can go and understand what is the topology and the risk profile of my environment look like without having to have half a dozen different tools running to do that. You have literally just a single Twistlock Defender running on that node. It provides you these runtime defense capabilities, that vulnerability visibility, this set of compliance checks that covers the CIS benchmarks for Linux and for Kubernetes and so forth, all in this one singular platform. Alex, did you have a question? I did. I'm looking at this and I'm looking at the uh, different uh, color identifiers for the notifications. Mm -hmm. what, what, is, what, are you, what are you expressing there? So you can see here that, that the, uh, the severity levels of the compliance checks, we've had our research team go through and score that. One of the difficulties you often have with implementing compliance benchmarks is, is if you look at just CIS itself, um, you'll literally have hundreds of different checks that are recommended in there, but they don't provide a categorization of that to say like these are the ones that are most critical. So we went back and, and did that for our customers and, and have this simplistic but, but pretty effective way of saying, there's low, medium, high, critical compliance checks, and that allows organizations to start with those things that are most important to them, and then to filter down after they get all the critical stuff done, they'll focus on the high and so forth, so they can spend those scarce compliance and security uh, resources on the things that are going to really have the biggest impact. Great. Let's move on. I want to hear, I want to see more. Sure. So the, the next thing I'm going to show you is this capability that we have uh, around host forensics. So... All of these different services, all these different applications that we have are doing various things in the background on, on all these nodes that we're running on. And so if, if we take a look at uh, what those models look like for a given host, you can see all the different background apps that are running on a given host. You can see the capabilities that are associated with the, each one of the individual applications. But one of the really cool things that we've done is we've taken the forensic capability that we've done for containers, and we've now added that for host as well. And what this forensics capability does is it provides you with basically an ongoing first in, first out view and log of all of the detailed process activity that occurs on all of the nodes around your environment. And that information is then selectively, for, selectively forwarded to our console in a situation in which that, that node may have experienced an incident. Um, you can also pull that information on demand. So if you need to go back and you know, figure out exactly what occurred on a host or you want to be able to go in and, and filter for activities and, and really understand in a very detailed way all the things that have happened on a given node, the user activities, you know, the specific commands that have been run um, by all these background services, you can get all that information directly from Twistlock. And the way that I always refer to it or think about it for customers is it's almost like having a flight data recorder. Um, the same way that a flight data recorder is always there on the airplane recording all the you know, airspeed and decisions that, that pilots make and everything else that goes on in that environment, the same thing is occurring with this forensic log. We have that for every one of the containers that you run in your environment. And now with this release, we also have it for every one of the hosts. So you can go in and get this really detailed information that says, like, I want to look for, you know, activities at this particular background service performed. I want to see exactly what commands were run. And that basically allows you to go back in time prior to there being an incident 
and understand what may have led to it, as well as to go forward in time after the incident has occurred to understand what other things an attacker may have done. Uh, and it's really kind of an unprecedented level of visibility that you have to these hosts because we're doing this in a really efficient, distributed way versus having to pull all that data into one central location, which historically made it really difficult to manage that at scale. Yeah. What's the underlying architecture to provide that capability? Is that like a data streaming environment? Yeah, basically, each one of the defenders that runs on each one of those nodes out there is maintaining this buffer locally. So it's constantly recording this activity locally. It's getting this information from existing kernel interfaces that are basically giving a near real-time view of, of all of these system calls that are being used to invoke processes and all the other activities that we capture. And it's buffering and storing that information locally on the node. Uh, and then, again, when an incident occurs, that information is automatically forwarded to the central console. And you can, as you just saw, pull it on demand as well to be able to look at it that way. Excellent. So the next thing I'd like to show you is a little bit about these custom rules that we've added. Um, this custom rule runtime language that we have is, is basically a way for customers to be able to define very discrete and fine-grained descriptions of things that they want to monitor for and activities that they want to take action on within their environment. Um, and, and that basically goes above and beyond the models that we always have in the product that are created automatically. You know, we know that, you know, this service should run, you know, Nginx or this container should only run HTTPD or whatever. And we continue to have that. That automation is really a key part of what we do. But there's also some scenarios where you may want to have a, an even finer grain, more discrete level of control uh, over exactly what the application should do and the behavior of the system. And you can see a quick example of that here. You know, I can define this rule that's very clear. It says, like, I want to basically look for any time somebody runs netcat and creates a listener on my node. And you can see here, I've got this very nice built-in uh, IDE. So I can go here and say, for example, uh, in the product, I can um, uh, automatically go and, and edit this rule here uh, and say, for example, like, and, you know, proc dot and then I have autocomplete here and I can look at all the different parameters. So it's a very simplistic and, and, and kind of user-friendly way of defining these rules. And because it's so targeted, I can now filter this data out and only see those specific things that I care about. Um, so for example, if I wanted to block that, I could. In this case, I've got a, a basic um, uh, demonstration set up where I'm just going to run uh, netcat in this environment. And when I, I run netcat, I'll run it with a dash P or dash L parameter. So we'll do uh, netcat dash LP. You know, we'll listen on port, you know, 9999, for example. Um, and in this case, we're not preventing that action. So when I exit out of this, you'll see now that this rule will have taken effect and we'll have audit information that corresponds to that rule. So if I go look at my host audits here, uh, I can see the netcat. Um, actually, I don't think I have the rule enabled. Uh, if we go back here, we'll turn that rule on, and then we'll actually see that. So you saw there was no netcat uh, uh, rule that was emanated there. So let's go ahead and add netcat to the policy. Uh, so we have this one that we call test. And we'll save it now. And so we go back and we'll run netcat again. And we'll just exit out of that. And look at our event viewer, and you can see here the event that we just captured here. Um, and that's just a very simplistic example of a way that, that you can, again, have a, this very discrete kind of rule language that describes exactly the things that you're interested in that you care about and then what actions to take. And those actions span processes, file system, network activities, and this works both for host as well as for container activities. So it's a really kind of a, a much higher level of control and configurability about what we do at runtime and, and how that runtime behavior works. So is there a rules engine underneath that? And, do you call, and is it an SQL call? Or how is it that you're building that kind of that engine for the rules? It's actually something that we built completely internally. One of the reasons why we built it internally was we, we feel like to do this well and to do it in a way that's practical for people to use, it has to be very high performance, which means that we can't use something that has a lot of other external dependencies and pulls in a lot of like external libraries and overhead that would bloat the amount of resources that the defender uses. One of the things that's always been a really important engineering um, pillar for us is to balance security with the performance uh, impact that that security has to a given environment. Uh, and so this is an entirely internally built rule processing engine, and it executes strictly within Defender itself. So there's no external process, there's no additional agent or anything else that you need to install in the environment. Literally, you just have Twistlock running on a node, and you've got the capability to use these rules. 
Mm-hmm. Great. Well, let's finish up. I'd like to hear just a few more things and then I'd like to get some last thoughts. Yeah. So um, we have a bunch of other capabilities in the product around uh, host file integrity monitoring that are relevant to, to uh, uh, host scenarios where you can create rules to, to monitor changes within your file system. Uh, we have this cool capability for log inspection where you can look for and, and actually have like a real time log processor parser uh, that specifically focused on security scenarios for things like SSHD and pseudo events. These are all capabilities that, that people typically have to have to, to maintain their compliance requirements for, for host. Um, one other really cool thing that we have is, is that same kind of custom runtime rule language that we support for protecting host. We also have a similar capability for Kubernetes and for being able to, uh, to literally uh, be the back-end event stream processor for the Kubernetes dynamic audit sync. So you can see here a, a really simplistic example where I just want to capture any creation of a privileged pod. You know, you can imagine here that audit data is, is very verbose and very open-ended, so I can be really specific in what I want to look for. But in this case, I can have this very simple rule that says I want to look for the creation of any privileged pod. Um, if I go and I create a privileged pod in my environment now, um, you'll see that, uh, that Twistlock will detect that and we're detecting that in real time because every time Kubernetes is seeing uh, activity within that environment, it's going to fire off and detect that that actually occurred there. You're going to see those creation activities of this privileged pod here that, that you can see uh, Twistlock detected when that was uh, when that activity was done. Um, and so there's a lot of stuff that we have in the product that's designed to, to really give customers that, that full spectrum of capabilities, runtime defense, firewalling, vulnerability management, compliance, not just for the containers and serverless that you already know us for, but now also for the host operating systems as well. Don, thank you so much. There's a lot here to further explore in what you've discussed just in these 15 to 20 minutes. I guess my last question is we're seeing a lot more people adopt container technologies. We're seeing a lot more people familiar with distributed architectures. AWS is testament to that, but but also there's this multi-cloud story that's really developing too, yeah. cloud native technologies. How does this bridge users? How does this, how do you, you know, how are you, are you thinking about the larger community out there? Because when you're thinking about VMs, you're thinking about people who, who may have a lot of experience working with VMs. And yeah. this seems to be an approach for them that, you know, that they can use. But I'm curious about your, your perspectives on that bridge so people can make that jump into cloud native technology approaches. I mean, it's a great point. We've always built the product to be focused on supporting whatever kind of topology that the customer has. We don't require that you be in Amazon or in Azure. You don't have to run, you know, different Twistlock environments for different cloud providers. Um, some of our first customers were in the Intel community and run entirely on-premises, entirely air-gapped, and that's fine too. Uh, this one platform that we have gives you capabilities to protect against all of those different, like, physical locations for your compute, be it on-premise or any one of the major cloud providers or, or any cloud provider for that matter. But I think to your point, it also gives you that single platform that you can use to protect across that continuum of compute options virtual machines, containers, serverless. And the reason we built that is, you know, we've been told by customers they don't want to have to buy and run different tools for protecting VMs versus containers versus serverless. You know, they see these as all just different ways that they can run the same kind of modern workloads. They want to have a single platform that they can use to protect all of that. That's also a modern platform itself that they can access programmatically, that they can get the data out in open formats. And that's really driven the, the product that we built to, to give you that singular capability that spans all those different compute options that really is relevant from the beginning of the life cycle and development all the way to production and works across whatever physical environments you might be running those workloads in. John, thank you very much for joining us today. I'm Alex Williams of the Newstack. Been joined today providing a demo for us. John Morello, CTO of Twistlock. John, thanks again and we'll talk soon. Thanks, Alex. Trusted by 35% of the Fortune 100, Twistlock is the world's first truly comprehensive cloud-native security platform, providing holistic coverage across hosts, containers, and serverless in a single platform. Twistlock is cloud-native and API-enabled itself, protecting all your workloads regardless of what underlying compute technology powers them.